Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. What, this show is brought to you by the Open to Hope Foundation as well as the Compassionate Friends. Well, Heidi, we've got a really important topic today because we're going to be talking about when is grief complicated. And this has been a big question that's been going on around it in the grief and loss world. And we've got a couple of three parents today mm -hmm. who are going to shed some light on this topic for our audience. Yeah, I really love this, Mom, because like you said, it's a very controversial question. And among bereaved parents, some of them wonder, you know, is there even such a thing as complicated grief? Mm -hmm. And I guess I want to say before we even start, very, a very small percentage of the country has complicated mm -hmm. grief. But there are some people that do, and there's some things that we can do to help them. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but first let's introduce our guest. Yes. First of all, we've got my buddy, Lonnie Ciotek. Hi, Lonnie. Hello. Hello, Lonnie. Good to be here. Lonnie's my golf partner and good friend, and her son Terrence died uh, six years ago. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then we have Laura Sullivan. Hi, Laura. Hi. Hello, Laura. And Laura lost her son Kyle also six years ago, and we just found out about that, didn't we, Heidi? Right, absolutely. And, and it's interesting that both of these bereaved parents are at the six year mark. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that they're both in that place. Right, and so people can take a look at that. Well, Lonnie, let's start with you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Terrence? Uh, I know he was a fabulous guy, mm -hmm. and you have a yes. fabulous family, and I think we've got a picture of him that we're gonna bring up here. Yeah, and he was All a right. very good looking guy, I have to say. Yes, Terrence was probably my mo most beautiful baby. Mm -hmm. And um, he was very, very special. Um, from the time he was born, he belonged to the neighborhood and the world. Wow. Uh, and to give you a little example, at the age of three and a half, he was already being asked to dinner <laughs> wow. within two, the two block square radius. And he just, he had an interviewing personality. Mm -hmm. That's, and um, he was, it was a wonderful child. Now, now skip forward because yes. he went through medical school mm -hmm. and what, yes, he what did. illness did he have? He I had multiple sclerosis, which he contracted at age 32 wow. and um, the first couple of years it blinded him. Wow. And mm -hmm. then um, if you know about multiple sclerosis, it disintegrates the wraps around all your nerves. Mm -hmm. So then the pain started and it really took him down. And through all this, he d did some specialty in medical yes. school? And yes, he was a first-year surgical resident at Mercy oh. Hospital in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And he married? And he married a nurse in the hospital. Who had, she a, had a little a boy, she so did. he had a stepson, and then they had their own baby. And yes, they um, did have their own baby. And um, Terrence devoted um, the years that he was laying infirm in bed, he devoted those to homeschooling Doug. That's who at amazing. that time was three. Wow. So by the time Doug was um, five, he knew multiplication, division, and he was starting algebra because Terrence just poured everything That's he had. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So he kept living his life fully. Yes. Even when he got sick yes, and he began to deteriorate, he still found meaning and yes. purpose in his life. Yes. It's phenomenal. And I know you used to go back and take care of him, and he'd be yeah. like, Mom, Get yes. a life. You need to do this to help me. <laughs> yes. You need to do that. Yes. And you'd say, I can't do that. And he'd say, yes. oh, yes, yes you can. Because wow. we were playing golf together. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd go back when he, when he would be hospitalized for mm -hmm. infections. Yeah. And yeah. I'd go back and make sure that the doctors were washing their hands mm -hmm. and the Hopefully. nurses because he didn't trust anybody. Yeah. 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 Well, he knew because he was a doctor. Yes, mm -hmm. he did. Yeah. Wow. So you've had a big family, and I know you guys yes. always remember him and do different yes. events. Talk about a couple of things you do for him. Well, of course, every year um, we celebrate Terrence's birthday, which is um, March 4th. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, get, we go to church together, and um, then we have, you know, luncheon after. But as, we, as a family, we get together, not you know, on our birthdays or Easter, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever, anniversaries. And we, all, we always talk a little bit about Terrence. Mm -hmm. They talk about Terrence mostly among themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't really talk the to me about Terrence. Uh, mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. They're trying to be good kids. Mm -hmm. I was never sure what <laughs> that was about, but. Yeah, well, 
I, I can say one thing about that. I do want to speak for the siblings because oftentimes, and I can't speak for your kids in general, but from yes. what I see and in my own experience, we know that our parents have been through so much mm -hmm. and we've seen how much they've been through and we don't want to cause them any more pain. So often we will hide our grief from them and talk amongst ourselves and not to our parents. Yes, well, I yeah. suppose. Just out of being, good. we want to be good. We're trying and to help them. And you've got how many yeah. kids? Five children, including mm -hmm. Terrence. Yeah. Set of twins in there. Twin oh. men. Wow. The twin men. I the twin men now, I call them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you've got, and you've got one daughter. One daughter. And how many at, grandkids? At 13. There will soon be 13. Wow. And where is Doug now? Doug the little is boy in that Pittsburgh. Terrence homeschooled. He, yes. He's done very well. He's, I'm sure um, he has. A uh, junior in high school wow. in Pittsburgh. Wow. And. Um, he visits us, mm -hmm. and our family takes he, him on vacations. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Laura, uh, let's get to you a little bit about your son, about Kyle. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, just out of high school? He was 20 mm -hmm. okay. when, when he passed away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. And he was, good. he was also a very good looking boy, and he had dark yeah, hair. We have a picture of him. These, also. these two boys yeah. looked similar, very dark mm -hmm. and good looking. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, similar dark eyes. Uh -huh. and Interesting. And, and how well. many kids do you have? So I have two of my own and then three stepchildren. Mm -hmm. Now were you mm -hmm. a therapist uh, when your son died? I was not. No. Okay. I was working in special ed and doing case management work uh -huh. and his death is, is what propelled me to go and mm -hmm. become a therapist mm -hmm. so that I could give back and really have a purpose mm -hmm. for his loss. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. how long uh, did you wait before you did that? It was a little over a year. Mm -hmm. And I knew, um, you know, shortly after his death, I knew I wanted to do something to make meaning. I just didn't know what it would be. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then waited about that year time frame. And, and, and how did Kyle die? We don't know. Okay, you don't yeah, know? Yeah, So we he was know. just found and nobody knew what happened? Yeah, they were unable wow. to determine cause of death. And so it's, it's possible that it was homicide. It's possible, mm -hmm. you know. You know, it's interesting because wow. we have two different types of loss yes. here, Heidi. We have a, the long term, and you knew mm -hmm. for how long? <clears throat> Six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then the sudden death. So mm -hmm. um, some different things, and and I think it might be a good time now to look at uh, complicated grief mm -hmm. because um, I think that sometimes it can be a long term loss, and sometimes it can be sudden. Uh, people mm -hmm. think sometimes that, well, it's a long term, so uh, it's a lot easier for those people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not the case because yeah. you've been taking care of them, worrying about yeah. them. You know, they've been their, your number one thing. And sometimes mm -hmm. you're almost uh, out of a job in a way mm -hmm. or some of the things that you were well, doing. I, I also hear parents that have children that have terminal illness, and Lonnie can speak to this, say to me, Heidi, at the end of the day, I really didn't think they were going to die. Mm -hmm. I just felt like there would be a miracle or something would happen. Mm -hmm. And even though people told me I didn't believe it until they mm -hmm. actually took their last breath. Yeah. So it was still sudden in some ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so, so when we talk about complicated grief, mm -hmm. it's not so much how they died, mm -hmm. although yeah. that does impact it, but how it impacts us. Yes. Right. 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 So let's talk about, uh, we've got a slide coming mm -hmm. up now. Let's talk about Com the indicators of complicated grief. Okay. If we could get that slide up, and could you go over those for us, and then we're going to uh, talk about them a little bit and get your you two's input. Yeah, sure. So these are are five of of a list of ten, but these are the strongest five. The first one would be strong feelings of disbelief uh, about the loss, mm -hmm. and uh, not willing or able to accept it. Mm -hmm. The second um, one that we see are obsessive thoughts, um, and those can range in all kinds of um, behaviors. And then the third would be isolation and not wanting to communicate with anyone. Um, another one, the fourth one here, we have the, a difficult time, um, and it can actually um, become an inability to really trust other people. And then the fifth um, most significant is, is there is an extreme level of avoiding anything to do with the loss or the loss mm -hmm. loved one. Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's uh, tease these out a little bit, mm -hmm. Heidi. Okay. And uh, and what comes up for you most in that list? I guess one thing that comes out for me is that most of us, in fact, I think almost everybody has strong feelings of disbelief. Yeah. That's even right. if you're not complicated. 
That's right. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking of that with you, Lonnie, um, where somebody doesn't live with you all the time, sometimes mm -hmm. people can kind of ignore it and say, right. it didn't really happen. Right. You yes, know, and true. getting into that and developing mm -hmm. awareness can be hard, right? Right. Well, well, I remember when Scott died, I was away at college and I went home, you know, for the funeral, but then I left again and when I went home for Christmas, I honestly expected to see him. Yeah. Even though I knew he was gone, I still didn't believe, I was still in disbelief. I really did think that he was going to be there when I opened the door. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I experienced that with Kyle as well. It, I had for a long time told myself he was just away at college. Right. And so I think that is really normal with grief. This would be an extreme level of that mm -hmm. where after a significant amount of time and inability to uh, accept the loss mm -hmm. and to believe or even hear from others. Mm -hmm. And when you say a time, tell me about that. What is there a time frame where people have to start looking and saying, okay, wait a minute, maybe I do have complicated grief? Yeah, it's a really tricky question. It's okay. really controversial. Okay. Um, so the complicated grief center has set, given a six month time frame. Okay. All of us on this set know that six months we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're really in that beginning. Right. phase so it it can be I think it needs to be where it's actually causing functional impairment and goes on for a length of time and okay. depending on the relationship of the loss yeah do you remember the disbelief Lonnie mm -hmm. well um, probably it was at least six months because mm -hmm. Terrence lived in Pittsburgh right mm -hmm. so it would be easier to disbelieve right yeah that he yeah passed mm -hmm. yeah um, absolutely one of the things I get concerned about, frankly, is that I see some of the younger people now not wanting to see the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a reason people see bodies. Mm -hmm. It's called seeing is believing. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've, so the research I've seen on it shows that it doesn't matter probably six months or a year out whether you saw them or not, mm -hmm. but a lot of people believe that actually seeing them can help you to move into the developing awareness where mm -hmm. you know you know that you've had a loss. Let's talk a little bit about obsessive thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, what about those? I mean, I remember the monkey mind where mm -hmm. you think about nothing else for a while. Mm -hmm. And you know, have you got thoughts about that? Yeah, some some of the examples with obsessive thoughts would be that um, in, in, in Heidi, you mentioned a really important point that it's an extreme, you know, um, extreme situations and very small percentage of people, mm -hmm. but they become actually obsessed about um, re kind of living the steps of their loved one, doing what they would do, only eating what they would eat, uh -huh. or in a situation where it's an ambiguous death, um, really going to extremes to try to get answers. So these are kind of some examples where it would show up. What about being stuck in the trauma narrative? In other words, reliving uh -huh. over and over and over the way that they died. Yes, that's and another. And running it in your head and not being able to get out of that thought process. Would that be considered obsessive? It, it can be. And okay. sometimes what happens is the trauma narrative becomes the new narrative in a sense mm -hmm. of identity yeah. for the person instead of their own sense of identity. So they become enmeshed in that trauma narrative and take mm -hmm. that on as their own existence. And we worry when that happens. Mm -hmm. Lonnie, does this bring up anything for you? When no, I didn't. I, I have not experienced that mm -hmm. in reliving. Mm -hmm. I, I would probably the most obsessive, I mean, maybe it would be obsessive. I remember alphabetizing every card I received. Mm -hmm. And I did go through months of t all of his, all of his pictures and his life were mm -hmm. categorized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really normal, I, really yeah. normal. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in shoe yeah. boxes, I still have. Yeah. yeah, Trying to organize and make sense. Very so or I yes, I, I did. Making sense I did trying to organize yes. something. I organized his is, life as to yeah, yeah. The, the moving the process. Till it stopped. Well, uh, let's talk about isolating behaviors because mm -hmm. I think that is is it's really huge, yeah. very large. Yes. Yeah. If you are not able, to, some people can't leave the house or right. whatever, or don't want to see anybody. And right. one of the problems with isolating, I think, is that you don't you start to think you're not normal. And I think when you mm -hmm. reach out with other people that have had similar losses, yes. and you say things like, I can't believe this happened, or mm -hmm. I feel like I'm going crazy, other people can say that's normal, I felt the same way. Right. And then you can say, oh, okay. And that helps you really to feel better. Yeah. But 
if you isolate, you don't get that feed. You don't get any feedback from anybody or any support. Yeah. And uh, Lonnie, you are a perfect example of somebody who doesn't do that and right. didn't. And you know, you were amazing riding around in the golf cart with me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it was. A, but you were with other people. You yeah. you yeah. really. I think that's one of the, your biggest strengths that I yeah. see is your ability to move out. Well, I think I can keep people away from me. Also, mm -hmm. I have a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, there's safe people who can handle it too. That's and, right. And I keep myself very safe. People. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even today. And I everyone mean. should do that. That mm -hmm. find the safe people. Some people are yes. good grievers. Some people are good grief support. Some people right. you can teach to do grief support, and some people yes. are just not going to be. And some yeah. people you realize you don't want to tell your story to because you yeah. don't want to take care of them. You recognize <laughs> that it's not yes. safe. Yeah. Exactly. 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 When. Um, a lady called me from um, this little club I belong to. She said, you know, you're not, I think it had been about six weeks. She says, you can't just stay home. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, mm. you're wrong. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I want to, I, I can, can do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And Gloria yeah. Horsley also told me that I could do anything I wanted for three years. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love, I love that. it. I that's love good. anything I want. Yeah. That's good. It's really good. Yeah. It's the best excuse. Yeah. <laughs> no, to I, your life. Yeah. Well, I think we ought to move on to look at interventions because I know okay. people are really going to want to know uh, some of the things mm -hmm. that we can do. So let's move on to the, the slide on interventions. Um, so I think while they're coming up with that slide, I think uh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things is um, receiving um, grief therapy. And this is with dealing with, again, complicated grief. So somebody trained in that, um, ideally. And then talking about the loss over and over is really important. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the, the things that we found is that people, sometimes even in therapy, don't talk about the loss. Mm -hmm. And so, and like you said, that hope of having people connect with you. Identifying support people is huge. And you talked about that, Lonnie, with the support of your family, getting together for Terrence. It's a really big mm -hmm. piece to helping in an intervention. And then um, this one that folks are seeing on the screen probably wouldn't mean anything, the empty chair technique to them. Yeah, you'd have to, that would be what a therapist that, would use. Yeah, would you? so that would be a little tricky to explain here. But the last one is probably my favorite and the most important, in my opinion, is the identifying um, um, support groups or safe people mm -hmm. to where you can get that feeling mm -hmm. of hope and universality and that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, yeah. Talk, let's uh, talk about a couple of more and then, then we, mm -hmm. let's really move into that support group. Um, what I, I know people are wondering, okay, the first one you said, uh, receiving traumatic grief therapy. If I really feel like, you mm -hmm. know, it's been over six months, I'm in, if, if people are of danger to themselves or others, we That's right. definitely need or, to or get Or if they help. can no longer function at work, at home. Yep socially in any area of their lives they yeah. really are completely right. incapacitated that's right yeah that functional impairment mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Th that that you really mm -hmm. need if you see that with some with your friend or with your mm -hmm. family member or yourself right you know reach out but where do we reach out to that's what i was going to ask you yeah and you too heidi what mm -hmm. suggestions do you yeah. have for reaching out well laura if they're going to do the complicated grief yeah treatment so, then yeah so if they were looking for complicated grief treatment in particular, mm -hmm. they could um, look on the website of Complicated Grief. Yeah, so compli go to Complicated it, Grief, mm -hmm. and there's some real research and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And therapists that are being trained in that now. So that, and, yeah, and Dr. Catherine Shearer of Columbia University, who is my colleague, yeah. she runs the, or, the, you know, the Complicated Grief right. workshops, and she's phenomenal. And yeah. she's doing so, a lot of training, and I know you've been And the been thing about it is, if you reach out to them and you're not sure, they'll let you know. They they'll have let a screening. You know. They mm -hmm. do. And they will let That's... you know, look, you are not in the right place. Right. And there have been people like that who have then been sent to me and yeah. Laura and other therapists out there. So you don't have to worry about it. If you're not sure, they'll tell you. If That's a really good point. Grief is, grief yeah. is complicated. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. And I know one of their treatments is talking about the loss over and That's over. Right. And that's one thing I love about Compassionate Friends. Yes. I have a group, and yeah. every once a month, we mm. everybody talks about their loss yes. over and over. Yeah. Well, you know? I think that's really important. And when I do therapy, I have people come in all the time and say, Heidi, I know you've heard the story. I'm just going to say, you know, I, we've heard this mm -hmm. before. I said, yes, but every time you tell me, mm -hmm. you might tell me in a little different way. That's right. So I'm looking for little significant shifts that are being made 
Yeah. And you need to keep telling it because the reality is, as you all know, society interrupts our story. That's right. A lot because people yeah. don't want to hear sometimes all of it, so they'll change the subject and move yes. us in different directions. Yes. That's you so talked true. about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's really true. And and I think um, you mentioned compassionate friends, and mm -hmm. actually, compassionate friends does naturally really everything that would be in the complicated grief curriculum just mm -hmm. by nature of you know, what they're offering for mm -hmm. folks. That's great. Yeah. And and Lonnie, uh, did you get a, Did you feel that you had enough uh, support in your community to talk about it early mm -hmm. on? What was your thought about that? Question. Yes, I do. I, of course, it's hard a little bit hard to go back, but um, I have another close friend that you know I talk to, and I have I I have my faith. Mm -hmm. um, That's, big. Um, That's an uh -huh. important Lonnie. I'm that has been that has that. been really the. Uh -huh the most um the biggest gift to me uh -huh. i go to mass three times a week um, mm -hmm. and um after mass we say the rosary uh, with i belong with these with these elderly people they're just wonderful they're and they're with me uh -huh. and sometimes i have a little coffee with them but we have a relationship uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. and they've carried me uh -huh. and uh it's been the, the biggest um, help in my life. That was the gift mm -hmm. my mother gave to me was a small child. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's, uh, and that's a lot to meet with the same people three times a week and have yes. that kind of support. And like you said, yeah. the caring. Yes. And sometimes they hold the hope for you. Mm -hmm. They do. When you, if you've they lost do. your hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think it's important, you know, we're talking about compassionate friends, but mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there aren't a group in your community, mm -hmm. or maybe it's another, you're watching a show and you've mm -hmm. had a parent loss, it's not mm -hmm. a, a child loss. Mm -hmm. And I, I think people, uh, great places to go are your local hospice, call right. them and ask them who they use, mm -hmm. uh, call your hospital, yes, and ask who, who what kind of people, you know, who they can recommend mm -hmm. for groups mm -hmm. or whatever and find out what's right for you and yeah. Heidi talk about if you don't like your therapist mm -hmm. I always say where's the camera there it is I always say shop around right use your first therapy session to find out if you are a good fit with that therapist mm -hmm. you're interviewing your therapist mm -hmm. and if they have a problem with that then you're not a good fit with them mm -hmm. so that's the way I look at my for all my first sessions mm -hmm. and I've been doing this work for many many years mm -hmm. that's to see if we're a good fit together if you're not right. totally comfortable with me go out and get someone you're comfortable with because uh -huh. therapy is a very intimate thing it as is. Laura knows yeah. and we tell our deepest darkest things uh -huh. to our therapist so you want it to really really be a good fit and I love what Lonnie said about her group because I had uh, a wonderful guy John Romano who's a professor emeritus at the University of Rochester always used to say Gloria if you had three good friends that you could talk to you wouldn't need a therapist that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well yeah. that's what happened yeah. to me. Yeah. And um, exactly. that's really true. I've got an angel. And John Besides Ram Gloria Horsley. <laughs> <laughs> and John Romano used to call it rent a friend. Yeah. <laughs> well, because be. he saw grief and loss as being a normal process. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. And he saw also in this world, maybe, I don't know, 70 to 80% of mm -hmm. our problems are connected with loss. Mm -hmm. yeah. It may be loss of a child, loss of a parent, loss of a spouse. It may be loss of a job. Mm -hmm. yeah. It may be loss, loss of identity. Of identity. Yeah. Yeah. It may, you know, uh, maybe loss of the opportunity to drink every night because you right. find out you're an alcoholic and you can't mm -hmm. relax mm -hmm. doing that anymore. Yeah. So there are all sorts of losses that we have and, and being able yeah. to talk about them. But I also want to mention ADAC. Mm -hmm. Association of Deaf Educators, mm -hmm. because they have uh, people trained. They call it mm -hmm. thanatologists. Mm -hmm. You can go on their site, and mm -hmm. they will have people in your neighborhood yeah. who have actually dealt with grief and loss, because it is a specialty, it isn't it? Really is. And um, and the other way too, I was thinking, is Psychology Today. If mm -hmm. they put in their zip code and then a couple of keywords like grief, um, and in yeah. particular types of bereavement. That can be a really good way as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. A, it is a specialty because I, I was telling Heidi before the show in my community, a lot of the therapists I work with, um, grief scares them. It oh, really yeah. does scare them, and so well, they're afraid of their own grief. You that's right. Gone in and dealt mm -hmm. with yeah. it. It's a it's a powerful thing. So yeah. um, before we close the yeah. show, mm -hmm. I want to thank you guys so much for being on and sharing all this, and you're amazing. And the importance <laughs> of this whole thing is that people see you and they you know see you're willing mm -hmm. to talk about it. I mean yeah. if, if nothing else we're mm -hmm. talking about a topic 
that to heal from, you need right. to talk about. Right. And That's we're right. saying, this is okay. Yeah. yeah. This is okay. And you've got three bereaved moms here yeah. and a bereaved sibling that yeah. are coming on talking about yeah. the death of their sons and right. my brother. Yeah. yeah. So. But you are profes professional listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, that is lacking mm -hmm. uh, yes. in this yeah. world. I agree with you, yeah. Moni. I agree with so you. So you're careful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You just leak out your sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. Get, we want to create the space yeah. for others to tell their story. Yeah. yeah. And Lonnie says she has to, you have to leak it out if you're just a person in the world and see how much everybody can uh, take. No, I like that you're gonna now. Be, right? Exactly. I like yeah, that exactly. leaky idea because yeah. I always used to yes. think when they ask, how many kids do you have? I don't think, let's see, I'm at the supermarket. Right. <laughs> Right. What, what do I really want to go with today? So true. So true. <laughs> so true. So I like yeah. your leaking ideas. Yeah, it, yes. <laughs> it works. Yeah. Well, before we close the show, is there one piece of advice I would like you to each give, knowing you've had mm -hmm. your children die six years ago? What would it be? Lonnie, you want to start? Well, if you believe in a higher, a mm -hmm. higher person in this mm -hmm. world, which I do, mm -hmm. turn to that person. Mm -hmm. And pray, mm -hmm. pray for yourself. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Pray for yourself. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, so good. Mine is really that um, idea of finding a support person. I like your three friends, or you know, yours at, at church, or compassionate friends, mm -hmm. somewhere where you feel accepted and loved, and they can, like you say, Heidi, hold hope for you yeah. until you can hold it. I think that's huge. It made a huge difference in my life, and yeah. That well, thank you guys so much yeah. for being yes, on thank the you. Well, I have a new best friend now. Oh, I love it. Well, Heidi, it's been, <laughs> fantastic. It's yeah. been fantastic having them on the show today, hasn't it? It absolutely yeah. has, yeah. yeah. And we're hoping that everybody will look at their grief and see if they feel like it's complicated, if they need help, or mm -hmm. if they, wherever they are in the process, because mm -hmm. it's a very unique experience. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank you for watching the Open to Hope show, and we always want to remind you, and I'm sure these guys too, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. Okay, now we're going to talk because they're going to yeah, do we'll the talk over credits. The credits. Yeah. Yeah.